published again. Um, at the beginning of the year, I tried to stop this third edition because it was published, first of all, in, uh, I think, 1987, and then reprinted about 10 years later, and now it's been published again in the smaller version. Um, but the story goes back such a long time, and the drawings I made for it in the beginning were in the late 70s, when I was still not very skillful with, at uh, drawing and painting. And uh, thank you. Is it, Guinness has uh, changed its colour. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to keep an eye, keep a rope book also. We just felt this is, belongs to another time. It shouldn't be published again. But after speaking with the publisher for quite a, a few different conversations and checking the kind of sales figures and everything, they were just so sweet that I thought, well, we have to go ahead and do this again. So it came out in this new version. Um, a lot of the drawings in there I'm quite proud of. And um, ten of the paintings I'm very proud of because they were really good paintings and they were made just before the first edition was published, which was around 1985, 86, I was working on these. Um, it started the story started after I came back from India in 1976 when Keith Dowman, who's the author, came to see me in Bath uh, with a lady friend who I'd met in India and they had this very big car and I didn't know what kind of car it was. It was a Rolls Royce. That's how naive I was at that time. <coughs> um, and Stuart became my best friend for after that. She was with Keith but that fell apart. But I worked with Keith on these stories uh, for a long time. And working with those stories, because of where I'd come from in India, which was Tashijang, which is the, the tradition of a lot of these Mahasiddhas that come, the lineage had come from India into Tibet. And some of the teachers who I studied with actually belong to this tradition, which is a practice called Mahamudra, which is essential, essentially a practice which is in the Kagyu tradition, and especially in the Drupa Kagyu tradition. Um, so these stories resonated. I'd never seen them before. They resonated very, very strongly with me. And they're very simple, because uh, Mike, who, who uh, is helping me with these things today, called them supermen. It's the original supermen, because they really had these incredible psychic powers, miraculous powers. And the stories are full of these magic elements. And essentially, all of the stories start, or a lot of the stories start, with a person who could be a monk who's really in despair because his practice is not bringing any results, or somebody whose wife has died, or somebody who's so poor that life is no good, or somebody who's crippled. So it's a spectrum. There's actually 84 stories from all walks of life. And these people, in a state of despair, meet a guru, and the guru initiates them into a mandala and a practice, a spiritual practice. And then in a space of years, usually around seven to twelve years, these people attain what they call Mahamudra Siddhi. Mahamudra Siddhi is, essentially means enlightened mind. The actual word Mahamudra means the great symbol. But apart from having this attainment of enlightened mind, they also acquire what are known as the eight mundane cities, which are superpowers, which are the, the ability to pass through matter, the ability to produce any object you want and to dematerialize, the object to levitate, the object to read other people's thoughts. So the variations of these um, eight, eight great cities, there are many different traditions. So the stories are full of magic. and. These people have magical powers. For example, one of them was the... I just take in one story. It's a story of an, uh, a man called Chorangi. Chorangi means four limbs in Sanskrit. He was the son of a wonderful Buddhist king, or Hindu king, sorry. And his mother died, the king's wife died, and he took, the king took a young girl as his new wife. And the king was away one day, and his new wife was quite young, about the age of the sun, and she was looking down, and she saw how beautiful the sun was, and she sent her maidens down to kind of 
arrange for a seduction to take place, inviting in him up to her bedroom. And of course he said, uh, I can't do that, you know, it's my father's wife. And so she got really upset. So just before the king came back, she went into a room and tore all the clothes and scratched herself and then said, when the king came back, she said, your son raped me. And of course he was horrified and he said, my son has to die because of what he's done, which of course was the way it would be in those days. probably get a medal for doing such a thing now. <laughs> so he said, you know, take him, take my son out to the forest, kill him, cut his arms and legs off and leave him there to either die, either to bleed to death or to be eaten by wild animals. So when the people who took him said, and say, they loved this boy so much, and they said, no, we'll, get, we'll sacrifice our own son instead of you. And he said, no, you can't do that. You have to do what my father has decreed. So they cut his arms and legs off and left him there, propped against a tree. Nearby was a cowherd who was another one of the Mahasiddhas, who happened to meet another one of the Mahasiddhas, who told him, over there, there's a tree, and there's an, a boy who's just lost his arms and legs. Your duty is to look after him. This is part of your meditation practice. So he went over, and he found his boy sitting under a tree, and he kind of patched his bandages on his stumps that were left, and then for the next 12 or 20 years or so, would feed him every day, because he was a cow herd, and he would bring milk and make cheese and bring food. So he looked after this boy, and of course the boy had already been initiated by the same teacher who happened to be the cowherd's teacher. So this limbless boy was meditating under the tree. And eventually <coughs> these merchants came who were bringing all of these treasures to the king's palace and they were camping for the night and they were frightened that there might be thieves around. So they buried all of their jewels under the ground. And as they were burying them, the boy heard them and he said, who's there? And they said, oh, don't worry, we're just charcoal merchants. And he said, so be it. And so they went back and had a good night's sleep. And when they came in the morning and dug up, their char dug up where their charcoal, uh, their jewels were, they found that it had turned to charcoal. <laughs> so then they realized that this boy had cities. And then he realized that he had cities too. And he thought, well, if I can do that, I can create my own limbs. So he recreated his limbs. And they slowly, slowly appeared from empty space over a period of time, and then he became fully limbed. So this is a typical story of one of the Mahasiddhas. Um, other ones are much shorter, other ones are even longer. But they contain these elements of transformation, transmutation. And of course, all of these people in the end attain Mahamudra City, which is ultimate enlightenment, and bodily rise into the realm of the Dakinis, which is a heavenly realm 